places where they prayed or uh, had certain things in it and the muhajirin and the ansar and the place of the salah of the prophet and the member and the pulpit of the prophet and the qabr and the grief uh, the purpose of this chapter is basically since the book of al-Aqsam is to hold fast to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It comes in here, this chapter, the order of the Prophet ﷺ for the people of knowledge to be united because the disunity among the people of knowledge will cause the disunity among the followers. So the people of knowledge, they should, what bring them together is an ilm. And of course the people of Ahl Sunnah, they don't differ among one another in matters of uh, the principles of disease and matters of belief and so on. Uh, but it doesn't mean here that they won't have differences of opinions about matters because these differences does not cause any disunity among them. They will still be uh, brothers with the sake of Allah and they will mention one another with means of goodness uh, and it did not cause any disunity. So this is what is not, this is what means here, the things that will cause disunity, the thing that will cause enmity, the thing that will cause for people to be uh, taking different paths and so on. Uh, and that the people of knowledge, their affairs together is different than what uh, the masses are. Why? Because of the ilm. The ilm is supposed to affect one's manners and one's uh, belief and one's actions and so on. Like one of the early generations of Islam, one actually it was Ayyub Sikhtiyani, rahimahullah, and he is one of the narrators of the hadith of Imam al-Bukhari. Uh, someone had uh, said bad words to him, cursed him, and he didn't reply. So they asked him, why didn't you reply, defend yourself? He said, what do I do with the ilm that I have? What do I do with the knowledge that I have? What's the purpose of knowledge then? What's the difference between someone that has knowledge and someone that doesn't have knowledge? The people who don't have knowledge, they would act based on their desire. Normally, a human being would react. Whatever means is available, they would react. But the person of knowledge, the knowledge would uh, get the person to do what is right and to get them steadfast on the Salat al uh, and not to follow the desire but to follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. He said this is the purpose of the deen, the whole deen of Islam is to get the person away from following his desire to be abd to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of his desires and everything is subjected to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And that type of a person, he would never be deprived from fulfilling his desires. Because to be a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means being a slave of the most merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that knows the human beings well, that he would not create a desire in them and deprive them from it. It's only to regulate it, to do it with benefit, 
that would come back on to the individual and to the ummah as well. Uh, and also he talks about an issue that the ulama talked about, especially in matters of fiqh, the ijma' of the people of Mecca and al Medina, And then referring to the ijma' of the Sahaba, not uh, at any time, but at the time of the Sahaba, عنهم, and the consensus. And as consensus among the ulama, that the ijma' of the Sahaba, the Sahaba, the head consensus, all of them agreed about the matter, then whoever comes after them and differ among uh, one another, or they bring another opinion that breaks this consensus among the Sahaba, that what comes later has no value to it whatsoever. Right? So if the Sahaba, there's an issue that they have consensus, no differences among them, they have consensus that on one opinion. If someone comes after them, one, two hundred millions, it doesn't matter. If they say otherwise, it is a no thing. Why? Because the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they had consensus, right? Among this myth, among one another with regards to this myth. What uh, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu differed among themselves in, did not cause disunity among them, but just differences of opinions, right? Then uh, if the ijma' comes later, it's still not considered to be ijma. It, why? It's not considered to be consensus because they differ among one another. So uh, this is something very important. And also because of this, uh, you would find in the madahib, and I know the subject might be a little bit dry, but it's important to have some idea of how the aima, when they differ in the principles that they take in extracting the rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. One of the famous madhahab uh, uh, that takes with uh, or who talks about the amal ahl Medina or the actions of the people of Medina is Madhab Imam Malik, rahimahullah. Right? One of the things that is famous about Madhab Imam Malik that he would always say, Al-Amru indana kada wa The matter is uh, to us such and such. Indana or to us means to the people of Medina. So the, the actions of the people of Medina to him was one of the uh, means of evidences to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. But some people think it's just any time or any people of Medina. Of course not. Right? And that's why he divided it into four uh, levels. Right? The first level, the, the actions of the people of Medina before the death of Uthman radiallahu anhu. Right, when people are all together before the fitna started, before people coming from different places, right, before Uthman anhu, before the death of Uthman anhu, that means even during the life of Uthman anhu, the actions that were there from the time of the Prophet till the death of Uthman anhu, if the people of Medina were doing something, not a person in Medina, the people of Medina, they're all doing one thing, of course this is matters of deen, right, then this is uh, definitely to be followed because they understood the way the Prophet ﷺ and they were acting according to this. The Prophet ﷺ praised them. They said that, and he said والسلام, that these are the best generation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also praised them in the Quran. And this is not just Imam Malik says this, this is Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, and also Imam Muhammad. Right? The second level, and uh, which is if uh, more than that, right, the people of Medina and their actions without breaking the consensus uh, among the Sahaba عنهم, in general. This is also a valid thing and all the madahib they take with this. The third level which is basically the thing that had some differences among the ulama that Imam Malik rahimahullah took and also Imam Shafi'i and Riwayah from Imam Ahmed. And there is if there is a two hadith, for example, or two opinions, right? And it's difficult to uh, authenticate one or the other, and they're kind of two opposite opinions, right? Uh, which hadith to choose? Which hadith to follow? In that case, right, he would look into the actions of the people of Al-Madin. What their actions used to be. What they used to do this with this. Then the actions of the people of Al-Madina would uh, give more weight to one opinion or the other. So the people of Medina, their actions in this case is not a hujjah in itself, it's not an evidence in itself, 
It's one of the, as the Ramadan they call it, one of the muradjihad. One of the things that would uh, give more weight uh, to one opinion or the other. And there are many things that the ulama use in some opinions where it's very close. Uh, which one should uh, make this is more weight than the other? When Malik Rahimahullah would give more priority to the, the actions of the people of the Medina. Right? And this definitely is, uh, is a good thing. But it's not like if there's an authentic hadith. He would stay away from the authentic hadith because the actions of the people of Medina, of course, nobody would ever say that. And none of the ilma said that. And one of the hadith that he mentions here in the book uh, is the Sa'a uh, and the Muddah of the Prophet ﷺ, the volume that the Prophet ﷺ used to use to measure the, the things that needs uh, to be measured, whether it's from Zakat al Fitr, for example, the things that has to have a specific measure, for example, Zakat al Fitr. Is sa min tamr min shayil and so on. What is the sa? Arba'at amdat, full mud. What is the mud? It's a specific measure, like the meter and the, and so on for volume. It's like the liter and so on. It's a very set, specific one. And I meant to bring it with me, but I forgot. Right? I have it with me, the mud of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and it's uh, with the with the exact measures. Right, that it's drawn and it's given and it's passed from one generation to the other because this is something that is needed in the deen. When they make it approximately, for example, for rice or whatever, something like that, 2.4 pounds, this is just to make it close, right? But it has a precise measure, right? It has a precise measure because if you, if you give more, mashallah, this is no problem. Uh, but one of the hadith that we would hear is that. Uh, the, the sa'a of the, the mud of the Prophet was clearly set. And how would the, did they know that from the people of the Medina? This is after the Prophet this is the mud, it was a set measure. You won't go to the market there at the time of the Sahaba and one shop has one mud and the other shop has a different mud. Of course not. When you go to a place to, to, to the store, the one pound is the same one pound everywhere. Yeah, it wasn't authenticated as it is now, right? But the people of Medina, they were measuring things in exactly the same way. So this is the mud of the Prophet ﷺ that was mentioned in the hadith. And there's a famous story where Abu Yusuf, one of the uh, you know, major students of Imam Hanifa, rahimahullah, that he is basically one of the people that of the method of Imam Hanifa changed many things in it. Uh, because Imam Hanifa had a different mood. Right from the, and that's why they call it the, of that of the people of Iraq. So he came to Imam Malik and they had a debate about this. And when he took him to the houses of the specific Sahaba of the Prophet House of Ibn Umar, the house of Anas, So he saw that with his own eyes in the houses of the Sahaba, even if they passed away. So Abu Yusuf himself, he said, if the Imam, Imam Hanifa, would have seen this, he would have taken that opinion. Right? Because they were, their goal is to follow the way the Prophet ﷺ. So if people till today, they would take the measures of uh, the people of Al-Iraq from Imam Al-Halifa. It's slight difference, right? It's not like a major issue, right? Slight difference. Actually, slight difference will increase. So they're, they're safe, right? But it's still the correct and the precise way is the way of the people of Al-Madinah in this. And this is some, a lot of the ulama they took with this, especially with things that has measures that, that, that mean going back to the people of Medina. Things of zakat. There's no zakat on uh, vegetables. Right? How would we know that? This is how it was at the time of the Prophet from the actions of the people of Medina. And so on. And also he mentioned some of the things that, again, mashahid in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi the things that the Prophet places in Medina. And many of these places have changed now. So uh, there's not too much of a benefit of mentioning uh, these specific places, right? And the hadith in this chapter, all of them have been mentioned before sometime in the book. We didn't mention it because we didn't go throughout the whole book. So it's something that would have benefits in other places in the book, not necessarily to what is here is referring to. So we won't go into too much details of what the hadith, each hadith means. Uh, just to uh, get this idea and then inshallah hopefully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us life we can discuss it in whatever these chapters or these hadith in its different chapters. The first one he says Hadathana Ismail, Qal Hadathani Malik and that's Imam Malik, 
رحمه الله عن محمد بن المنكدر عن جابر بن عبد الله السلمي 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 مدة فتح أن أعرابيا أن أعرابي بدو بايع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على الإسلام. He gave the pledge to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم with Islam. فأصاب الأعرابي فأصاب الأعرابية وعق بالمدينة. The Arabi fell sick in the Medina. And the Medina used to be a place where people get sick in it. Right? And the same thing with the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم they went to the Medina and the main hijrah. They would get sick, and, and, and sick meaning here with the wa'ak, what it means by this is they would get fever, always. They would get fever in Al-Madin. And the Prophet Sallallahu made dua to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala that he pushes that away from Al-Madin, and uh, as a result of that, they were relieved from this, right? So this Arabi, he felt sick in Al-Madin. فَجَاءَ الْعَرَبِينُ إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَقِلْنِي بَيْعَاتِ he said, O Prophet of Allah, uh, give me back my bayah. Not that he wants to be a disbeliever, no, he doesn't want to live in Medina. Because they used to come and give pledge to the Prophet become Muslims and stay in Medina. Like this is Darul Islam. So, you know, that he wants to quit. He wants to go back, he wants to leave. Right? So, فَأَبَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The Prophet refused, he gave him the pledge. ثُمَّ جَاءَهُ فَقَالَ أَقِلْنِي وَيَعْتِ So he came to him and he said, Give me back my bay'ah, relieve me from it. So the Prophet refused. Then the third time he came to him again and he told him that, and the Prophet refused. So the Arabi left. فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما المدينة كالكير تنفي خبثها وينصع طيبها. That the Medina is like the Kir. The Kir is the fire or the the what is it? Farmers. Hmm? Farmers. Like the work of fire. Right. Yeah. The fire and when they make a lot of heat to uh, to to purify the the iron to take the dirt of the iron and so on. Hadith, yeah. No. So the Hadith. Hadith now. Uh, so the, the Medina is like Al Kir. What does the Kir do? Tenfi Khawatah. Kicks out, clean its khawath, its evil things, its impurities. So the one that would have the patience to live in Medina, he is someone that deserves to be in Medina, meaning among those who are pure ones. Those who would not able to stay in Medina are the ones that, you know, or the, the bad ones, they would be away from Medina. Well, Sa'utibuha and its uh, beauty and, and good smell and so on would be adorned in it. Uh, this is, does not mean that there won't be no evil people in Medina because there were hypocrites in Medina at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But there's another hadith where the Day of Judgment would not occur unless all these hypocrites and the evil ones will be away from Al Medina. Uh, and that's when the Dajjal comes and he won't be able to go into Al Medina and he'll stay outside and it will be shaken, right? And the hypocrites and those who are evil ones will leave Al Medina. Uh, and only those who are pure will stay there. And also the hadith is true throughout all times, for the most part. Not for every specific person, that if a person got to live in a Medina, that means he is, this is a, a certificate that he is saved. No. Uh, you know, some Abdullah ibn Ubayy bin Salul, the, the head of the hypocrites, he was in Medina, died in a Medina. So uh, it's, it's not for every specific person, but in general, yes, this is true. That's why an iman, as the Prophet said, that iman goes to Al Medina, and the word Ya'zir is very clearly explained with the example. Like the snake goes into its hole. How does it go? It goes in a very slippery, in a very easy way, right? So it does not need too much effort to go in there. It slips in there. So the same thing, the iman goes to Al Medina. So, and, and the virtues and the many hadith about the virtues of living in al Medina and the Prophet ﷺ giving the glad tidings for those who would have patience by living in al Medina because it's not really too much fun or too many things for people to do. That whoever is patient on the harshness or the toughness of living in al Medina, the Prophet ﷺ will intercede for him. And the virtues of dying in al Medina and many things, right? 
So, uh, although because of this still, uh, I mean, even this is what's clear to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, but when it comes to uh, other actions, most of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, they're not buried in Medina because they spread the deen of an Islam. So, uh, this is again to know the levels of deeds. Someone that is benefited somewhere else, right, then uh, his benefit should be extended. But someone, uh, if, if a person chooses to live in a Medina, Definitely, this is a good thing, right? But without uh, not like uh, choosing this of a lesser virtue than something else, another place or person is more benefiting to himself or to the Ummah and so on. So, again, the hadith is mentioned because of the virtue of the Medina here uh, related to the title. The second one is a very extended hadith, uh, and we won't get into the details of it now, inshallah ta'ala, because it's also mentioned in the second chapter. But briefly, till we get to the reason why he made this hadith here. Uh, he says, حدثنا موسى ابن اسماعيل قال حدثنا عبد الواحد قال حدثنا معمر عن زوري عن عبيد الله بن عبد الله قال حدثني ابن عباس رضي الله عنه قال كنت أقرئ عبد الرحمن بن عوف He used to uh, uh, read from عبد الرحمن بن عوف فلما كان آخر حجة حجها عمر when, when it was the last حجة that عمر رضي الله عنه made فقال عبد الرحمن بمنا عبد الرحمن نعوف سد المنا لو شهدت أمير المؤمنين أتاه رجل قال إن فلانا يقول لو مات أمير المؤمنين لما يعنى فلانا المنا is the last حجة of عمر رضي الله عنه عبد الرحمن نعوف سد that a man came to عمر رضي الله عنه and he said to him that somebody is saying if أمير المؤمنين the leader of the believers meaning عمر رضي الله عنه if he dies we would give pledge to so and so Right, so this is, can be a, a starting thing of a fitna, right? Uh, people are already deciding who they going to appoint as a khalifa. فقال uh, عمر سو عمر رضي الله عنه سد أقومنا العشية فأحذرها أولاء الضغط الذين يريدون أن يغصبوه. He said I would uh, get up and I would warn the people from what this is happening. These people that they're trying to take over and to take the rights of the people when they would just want to take over. And the people, the, the companions of the Allah uh, which is against what human beings they do when it comes to leadership and kingdom and rulings and so on, these people, they, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised them in the Quran, they were not after khilafah and so on, like some of the books of history, those who are with uh, filth in their hearts, they write these books of history. So they will write in the books of history what they perceive things and what they see things. So they put their own feelings and their own things in it. And they forget about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised these people in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, they were not after leadership. And if somebody would look at the life of Umar radiallahu anhu, being the Khalifa, this is not a life of someone that wants to be the Khalifa, right? When he's wearing something that has 12 patches on sleeping under a tree, right? And going after, running after the camel of the charity. The things that they would do and the life that they would live was not like the kings and the rulers all over the world. And they took it as a burden, which is a burden, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the hadith, that there is no Amir of Ashram, there is no Amir of ten people, unless he, he would come on the Day of Judgment, chain, till he free himself. This is authentic hadith. So he comes that he, like everybody is free to prove otherwise, you know, the Amir of anyone, any group of people, at least 10, he will come on the Day of Judgment, he has to defend himself, he has to free himself. That means he has to prove that he had done great, right, and justice and so on. So uh, he, it was not a matter of battle among this, it's all about the benefit of the deen of the people. Right, so uh, he said that he would warn them. So Abdullah bin Araf told them, لا تفعل, do not do that, meaning in Mina, in Hajj. فَإِنَّ الْمُوسَى يَجْمَعُ رِعَاعَ النَّاسِ يَغْلُبُونَ عَلَى مَجْلِسِكِ فَأَخَافُ أَلَّا يُنْزِلُوهَا عَلَى وَجْهِهَا فَيَطِيرُ بِهَا كُلُّ مُطِيرِ فَأَمْهِلْ حَتَّى تَقْدَمَ الْمَدِينَةِ دَارَ الْهِجْرَةِ وَدَارَ السُّنَّةِ فَتَخْلُصَ بِأَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم من المهاجرين والأنصار فَيَحْفَظُوا مَقَالَتَكَ وَيُنْزِلُوهَا عَلَى وَجْهَا طبعا this is something that 
great benefits, especially at all times, especially nowadays at all times. When he told them, he gave them the advice, do not do that. He advised Umar do not do that. Men I had to go talk to the people like this, the masses, those who are coming from the east and the west and so on. Because the Muslim or the season brings the Aranas, the low among the people and the high and everybody. Everybody's there. The good and the evil, everybody comes. And as a result of that, uh, they might be Ri'anas or the Safala or those who might not get what you uh, what you would tell them uh, because they are not among those who are the, having the, the right understanding and, and so on. They might be the, the majority, right, in your majlis when you speak like this. And I'm afraid that they won't understand it the way that you meant. So they would take it and they would, the expression mentioned here, that they would fly with what you say everywhere and they would spread what you said according to their understanding which is distorted because they are not among the people of, the, of understanding and they would take your words in a different way uh, so that would cost him so he said so wait be patient till we go to al Medina. this is why he mentioned the hadith here and the virtues of the people of al Medina. wait till we go to al Medina, dar al hijra the place of al hijra of the prophet sallallahu wa dar al sunnah and the door of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. and you will be there with the companions of the Prophet ﷺ from the Muhajirin and the Ansar so they will understand and comprehend what you say and they would understand it in the proper way right see so he was afraid of the misunderstanding of the people why because of the level of their uh, understanding and knowledge and so on coming from different places and they might have issues of understanding the, what he says which shows, of course, the importance of the people of Ahl Hill or Ahd, the people of knowledge, the people of understanding. The wise people, they are the ones that are supposed to decide for the Ummah, not every single person, knowing or not knowing. That's what uh, usually when they have elections and so on, right? Yeah, you, you make, you equal the one of understanding with the one that doesn't know anything about anything, right? They are, they are both are equal in uh, deciding what is good and what is better for the Ummah. As one of the ulama, they give this example, if you have uh, 41 or 49, right? 49 alim, not just alim of the deen, alim of deen and, and worldly things and good things that would benefit the people, very wise people, they very sincere, very pious, they don't need anything from this dunya except the pleasure of Allah. They want to benefit the people. They're very wise and knowledgeable in all matters of walks of life. Right? On one opinion. And you have 51 intoxicated, drunken. They are just basically away from this life whatsoever. They're just following their desires, major sinners, and so on. And they're on the other opinion. Who would win in a system like that? 51. So what does that Does that mean that this is what is the right way? That's why for people that they don't have right or wrong, this works for them. Everything is relative, is, is relative, right? There's no absolute right. One of the things that we need to teach ourselves and our children and our generations and so on, something that's supposed to be so basic and so principled that nowadays it becomes to be not really that strong. There's something called haq, there's something called bata, something called the truth, and something called falsehood. Sounds so simple, but to many people this is not the case. Right? There is true and there is false. There is good things and there is bad things. They would convince you there is no such a thing as a bad thing. Bad thing to them maybe is what harmed them personally. Stealing, killing, yes, sure, no problem. Everybody agrees that this is a bad thing. But in matters of belief, right? In matters of what is right and what is wrong, there is no such a thing. Who said that you're wrong? This is what I believe, this is what you believe. Right? And the human being, they fall into the strap and they waste their life and they may end up falling into the hellfire. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent messengers with the clear way that there is haq and there is not. Because human beings, they have no capacity. Look at the human beings without the wahi. What is their affair without the wahi? Debating with each other all the time from things that they would never think that they would debate hundred years ago. Right? And you would see that clearly nowadays. The things that they never thought that they would even think about that this is this is right, this is wrong, was wrong hundred years ago, 
now it's okay, now it's after, you know, whatever Allah, I don't know how many times it would be different, and you know, homosexuality and all these types of things. What happened to the people? Are they selling to be better? Of course not, this is not the case. But this is the, the sad thing about the human being, because they cannot really, this is the capability that they have, the arrogance that they think they know. They think they know what is right and what is wrong. And you can, if you put the side, if you put the wah aside, right? but if you hear one side only and the arguments, it yeah, makes sense, sure. And then you forget about this and you listen to the other group and they talk about the arguments and so on, you can say, mashallah, that sounds logic. And then you'll never find any solution. So just vote for it, right? So 51 ignorant person can win over 49 very wise people that know what is right and what is wrong. Life of the human being cannot be straight like this. They are in need of the wahya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge between them. So higher authority so that no human beings head to head, they will have this uh, competition between uh, one another. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the one asraq min Allah There is no one more truthful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And definitely this is the right way and they can even examine it and although we don't examine the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it's the perfect way of life if they would agree to the principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us. So at the time of Umar radiallahu and the statement of Abdul Rahman al-Awf teaching us what is the best way. So we should not be deceived, right? Like the whole world now is deceived by this way of life which is something that comes and goes away. Every nation comes, they are so amazed by the way of the ones that are strong and they think this is their truth then after some time it goes away you know, like Marxism and well, what was the affairs of the people in the 50s and the 60s I remember because I didn't live this time but uh, my father you know they always talk about these things how it was and I still have some newspapers from the time of uh, you know Gamal Abdel Nasser in, in Egypt and how he was into this socialism and so on people think this is deep and raising it in millions and thousands in the streets and this is the dream of whatever. And then what happened? Finished. And they all now disbelieved in all of this. And they go into something else. And this is a very sad, again sad thing for the human beings when they turn away from the source of their happiness in this life and in the year after. And that is the Qur'an and the way of the Prophet so uh, again, the hadith is, or this uh, tradition is mentioned because of the people of Al-Madina and how they would uh, understand and comprehend what he says. So he said, He took the advice and he said, I would do this once I get into Al-Madina. He talked to the people and he just mentioned part of it, not the whole thing, it will be mentioned somewhere else, in which that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he brought down to him the book and he sent the Prophet sallallahu with the truth and also he mentioned that he had revealed to him the ayah of al ghaj the verse of the Quran about al ghaj uh, Sunni, Al-Zani Al-Muhsan, the Zani, the one that commits fornication, if he's muhsan, married, and so on. And this is not now in the Qur'an, but it was abrogated from the Qur'an, but it was a verse, and it was abrogated from the Qur'an, and it's all by the will of Allah uh, Then the next hadith, the many hadith in this chapter, is حَدَّثَنَا سُلْمَيْ الْمُحَرْ قَالَ حَدَّثَنَا حَمَّادَ عَنْ أَيُّوبِ عَنْ مُحَمَّدْ قَالَ كُنَّ عِنْدَ أَبِي هُرَيْرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ وَعَلَيْهِ ثَوْبَانِ مِنْ كتان. That they were at, with Abu Hurairah and he had uh, two pieces of uh, clothes, uh, which means uh, tied with the red mud. So it was tied with red. Min uh, Kitan, Al Kitan is, uh, how do I say the Kitan? You know the, anybody knows the Kitan? It's a well known uh, cloth, it's a rough one. Uh, hmm? Polyester? Not, not uh, something that was. Just Say what? Just saying katan, we call it. Uh, katan, okay, so it's the same word. <laughs> right, but in English, is it the same thing? Uh, anyway, so it's from uh, katan, and they use it sometimes in the janazah uh, to, uh, 
if the person is leaking or something, so they would put it, put it you know, in the places where there is any leaks, so that it does not affect the kafan. So uh, he was having this, which is Abu uh, was poor. He was among the people of Ahlul Sufa at the time of the Prophet and this after the Prophet became a leader even of the people of Al-Madin. So now he had two pieces of clothes and so on. So he said, He said, It's a word to be said when a person is happy sometimes, or not happy but being amazed. So he said this about himself, putting himself down. He said, Abu Hurairah is now uh, blowing his nose in a piece of kitten. Right? Uh, he didn't used to, to have this level of uh, luxury before. He said, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي saying that about himself. Uh, I've seen myself, remembering the days at the time of the Prophet that uh, I've seen myself in the, the time of the Prophet when I would fall on the ground from the severity and hunger, I would fall between the member of the Prophet and the room of Aisha in this area that he would fall and he would faint as a result of being hungry. So a person would pass by me, he would put his foot on my uh, neck, and he would think that I'm majnoon, I'm crazy, I'm insane. And I wasn't insane, it's nothing but hunger. Right? And the long hadith that he mentioned when he was like this, and he would uh, so hungry that he would uh, shy to ask people for food, uh, because of the honor and dignity, but he would ask people a question. Maybe they would see in him that he's hungry and they would invite him for food. So he asked Umar Abu Bakr but he didn't get it. He gave him the answer and he didn't get uh, exactly what he meant. And the same thing Umar and then the Prophet came to him and maybe one time he said, uh, read this hadith in details because it has great benefits when the Prophet came to him and he looked at him and smiled. Prophet knew exactly what he was going through. And he told him, Ya Aba Hir, you know, Aba Hir, this is uh, to, uh, like, uh, what's, uh, like, giving it, uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like a nickname, or when you have someone that you don't say the whole name as a way of playing with him. Like the Prophet sometimes would uh, call Aisha, or the Allah, and he would say, Ya Aish. Right? So short, instead of short name. short name as a way of making some, uh, you know, fun with the person or to make him lean into relax with them. So the Prophet understood what he was going through and he told them, come on in with me. And he took him with him and he uh, showed him, he showed him a qalah that had milk in it, a cup, a little bit bigger cup that had milk in it. Right? And he told him, Abu Rayla, Go get the people of Ahl Sufa. So, well, uh, narrating the hadith, he says, I looked at the milk and I said, I need this more than the people of Ahl Sufa. And what Ahl Sufa would do with this milk, I can finish it on my own. I'm so easy. Imagine, I don't think any one of us had reached this level in which he would faint from being hungry, right? So, but he said, But there is no, ولا بد من طاعة الله ورسوله. And there is no way out, no, no way away from being obedient to the Prophet I cannot do anything, I have to be obedient to the Prophet So he went and he got the people of Ahl Sufa and they were around 80 people. Right? And the Prophet when he smiled to Abu Hurairah because he's teaching him a lesson. And he told him, Abu Hurairah, take the Qadah and you go to each one and you give him to drink till he's full and you take it from him. You don't pass it around. No, you give it to one. You give it to you. And then you go to the next person, give it to you like this. Which is also the etiquette of when you have a guest. You don't say, pass it around. If you have the means, right, if it's easy, then you should, you yourself, go back and forth. So Abu Radu Anu, like in that situation, he's doing this, right, and he going from one to the other, and after he finished all of them, and the Prophet looked at him and smiled. And he said, 
there's no one left except me and you, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. He said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet sallallahu told them, drink. And it was still the same amount of milk there, which is one of the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu So he drank and drank and drank, and then the Prophet sallallahu told them, drink again. So he did again. And then for the third time, so Abu Hurairah said to the Prophet sallallahu I can't find a place for it. That he drank till he was full. Right? So, this by itself is something that how, what was going through the mind of Allah, the whole thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for him. So, the point is here that uh, remembering these days and how he was in uh, these types of uh, situations, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, bestowed on him the faith. Why Allah mentioned this in this book, in this chapter? Is when you said Mashahid in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the places in Medina of the Muhajir and Ansar, the place between the member and the room of Aisha. He did mention the hadith because of the incident that was mentioned there. No, it's just because of the specific place that was mentioned in uh, the masjid of the Prophet. And the hadith is mentioned also somewhere. Uh, then he says, Hadathana Muhammad ibn Kathir, Qala Akhwara Sufyan, and Abdul Rahman ibn Abbas. قال سئل ابن عباس ذات عبد الله بن عباس was asked أشهدت العيد مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم did you witness the Eid with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم قال نعم he said yes ولو لا منزلتي منه ما شهدته من الصغر and if it wasn't my level my my relationship towards him I would not have witnessed it because I was too young he's the nephew of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, but he was too young, the Prophet ﷺ died when Abdullah ibn Abbas was on the verge of the age of puberty. Right? So he was very young at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So if he was someone else other than being the nephew of the Prophet ﷺ, a child, he would be away. Right? But because he said because of my relationship that he was the nephew of the Prophet ﷺ, he was able to be close to the Prophet ﷺ at this age. He says, فَأَتَى العلماء الذي عند ذلك كثير من الصلب. This is why he mentioned him, right? So he said that the Prophet وسلم came to this sign or this pole by the house of كثير من الصلب. This is a specific place in Medina. So he mentioned the hadith. Where is that now? Allah سبحانه وتعالى knows. فصلى ثم خطب ولم يذكر أذانا ولا إقامة. So he said the Prophet وسلم prayed, meaning prayed the Eid, صلاه. Then he made the khutbah and he did not uh, do any, Ibn Abbas did not mention adhan or iqam. There was no adhan or iqam of rain. Uh, it's uh, the salah immediately and then after that is the khutbah. Thumma amara bis salah. Then the Prophet ordered for people to give charity and but he ordered here the women. He came to the women, uh, to, uh, to especially the women to give. And as he said, فَجَعَلَ النِّسَاء يشرنا إلى آذانهن وحلوقهن فأمر بلالا فأتاهن ثم رجع إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So he said that the women kept pointing at their ears and their you know necklaces and so on. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ordered بلال and he went to them and he came back to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. نعباس was young رضي الله عنهما and he saw that from the women and the women gave from their you know jewelry and so on. Uh, giving charity and the Prophet uh, reminded them reminded them of the uh, charity and so on. So again, without spending too much time in the hadith, it's about that specific place that he mentioned. Then he says, حدثنا أبو نعيم قال حدثنا سفيان عن عبد الله بن دينار عن ابن عمر رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يأتي قباء ماشيا وركبا. That the Prophet وسلم used to go to قباء مسجد القباء as we all know. He used to go to it walking and riding. And he used to go to, uh, every Saturday, alayhi salatu wasalam. And there's a hadith, whoever uh, do this and pray to Raqqa in Masjid Quba, this is the reward of Umar, right? So the Prophet وسلم, was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pray in the Masjid of Quba, uh, as it's mentioned in the Quran. So this is one of the places where a person, when he goes to Medina, to go pray there. But when people Go pray in the seven masajid and all of that. This is not from the Sunnah of the Prophet. And there's no evidence actually of these seven masajid of being any significance. So, but to go to Quba is a good thing, it's a virtuous thing. 
And then uh, he says, حدثنا عبيد بن إسماعيل قال حدثنا أبو سامع عن شام عن أبيه عن عائشة قالت لعبد الله بن الزبير ادفني مع صاحبي ولا تدفني مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في البيت فإني أكره أن أزكى uh, عبد الله بن الزبير uh, رضي الله عنه he said to uh, uh, عائشة رضي الله عنها and she is his aunt right uh, because the mother of Abdullah bin Zubayr is Asma bint Abi Bakr, the sister of Aisha radiallahu uh, So he uh, gave the wasiya the order that he is to be buried with uh, his sawahibi. Uh, here is his companions. Uh, I don't recall exactly who, but he said, Do not bury me with the Prophet وسلم, in his house because I hate to be praised. When I'm not worthy of praise. This he was out of his humbleness, so the one who would ever uh, don't want to be married with the Prophet, but he did want to be praised. Like if his position would be there, then everybody would be going to uh, visit the grave of the Prophet and would see Abu Dhabi Zubayr with Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahuma, and of course there is those who are among the companions of the Allah, those who are better than Abdullah ibn Zubayr. So he understood this very well, like um, like Uthman Ali and so on. Uh, and this is the 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 insaf or the famous that they had He had the means to do this, but he refused so that people don't overpraise him or think of him something of a level that he is not in that level like uh, other companions of the Allah. Uh, there is a few more, but uh, this is fine. We'll stop, this point. we'll stop until at this point. Let me continue. Again, the purpose of the chapter here, it's not that we explain the hadith and every single detail of it. He mentioned it because of the places that it was mentioned in, the, in these sites of the hadith. And which is the grave of the Prophet, one of them.